title of today's talk is Heuristics for Backpropagation. We have uh, gone through uh, the backpropagation algorithm with sufficient details. We now know that uh, uh, how to adjust the weights of the <coughs> outer as well as the hidden layers okay, dependent upon the local uh, induced field and the local gradients. And uh, then we also uh, saw some of the other aspects like the stopping criteria, then uh, whether we prefer the batch mode or the sequential mode. Now, having done all these things, uh, it is required that uh, we know about the, uh, I mean, uh, I mean about some of the uh, heuristics that one can apply to the backpropagation uh, algorithm in order to ensure that the backpropagation algorithm functions more efficiently, right. So, in order to ensure its uh, more efficient functioning, there are some heuristics which are commonly used and these are the things that we are going to discuss in today's class. Okay. Now, some of the heuristics that we use for the back propagation is firstly that we had uh, initiated already the debate uh, related to the sequential versus batch mode of processing. So, sequential versus batch mode update. And there we have, um, and there one can note that the sequential uh, mode is computationally faster as compared to the batch mode. Okay. This is a very, I mean, interesting observation. In fact, sequential mode, as you know, sequential mode means that it is a pattern by pattern training that we do, whereas batch mode means that where the uh, weights are updated only at the end of one epoch, okay, only at the end of every epoch the weights are adjusted. Now, sequential mode is uh, computationally often faster than the batch mode because uh, if we go into the equations of the batch mode update which we did not, okay, we had considered the equations for the sequential mode of update only, but if we see the batch mode update we will see that uh, that involves the computation of a Hessian matrix which is highly time, time consuming, okay. whereas sequential in pattern by pattern that means to say we do not require that the computation is, uh, the, the computations are quite uh, simple. Okay. And in fact, uh, the fact that the sequential mode is computationally faster than the batch mode is true, especially when the training data set is large and highly correlated. So, we can say that this is true, especially for uh, large and highly correlated data set. Now, the second heuristics that one has to consider is regarding the maximization of the information content. Which means to say that if the training pattern, okay, if the training patterns contain good amount of information in it, okay, then the learning should be better, the learning should be faster. Okay. So, that means to say that we have to uh, go in for uh, some kind of a diversity in the training set. I mean, if, if, if the training set consists of a diverse set of patterns, that would really lead to 
uh, more information content and a better learning. Okay. And uh, there are two ways whereby uh, this can be achieved. So, the two ways whereby the maximization of information content can be achieved is first is the use of examples that result in large training error. This may appear to be puzzling because why are we really preferring those examples which are having large training error, but definitely what happens is that when there is a large training error, okay, the large training error definitely leads to a larger value of the local gradient and a large value of local gradient makes the learning process faster. Okay. So, uh, I mean one of the ways is to have, uh, uh, I mean to pick up examples having large training error and the other is to use examples which are radically different from those that is previously used. In fact, in the pattern classification problem, we often uh, achieve this by randomizing the presentation of pattern. That means to say that whenever we are going in for a sequential uh, mode of learning, okay, then what happens is that we uh, complete one epoch. Okay. Let us say that there is some order in which the patterns are presented and then when the next epoch is uh, uh, carried out, I mean that means to say when the training is done for the next epoch, that time you just randomize the order in which the patterns are presented. Okay. Now, this uh, could appear to be somewhat, uh, I mean unnecessary by some people because after all, I mean your uh, job is to present the set of patterns. Okay, which constitute the training set. Okay. Does not matter whether they are presented in one particular order or, with or they are presented in a different order. But one thing is very important that if you keep the same order let us say, I mean let us say that uh, from pattern to pattern you are keeping the same ordering, okay. I mean from epoch to epoch you, you keep the same ordering. In that case there is a risk that the network will learn the ordering also. Learning the ordering means that as if to say that when you are feeling the second pattern, it expects the that pattern to be classified into some class. When you present the third, it expects that to be classified into the uh, I mean other categories. So, in order to uh, avoid that okay, and to have a uh, better learning uh, capability, one very often randomizes the order in which the patterns are presented. So, we can say that the pattern presentations, pattern presentations are randomized. In fact, this has got more meaning only if you are having uh, a sequential mode because in batch mode it really does not matter that if you are altering the order of pattern presentations on or not because in the batch mode anyway the weight adjustments are done at the end of the epoch. right? So, this is the second heuristics and the third important heuristics that one uh, considers is the activation function. Okay. Now, we have so far explored different type of activation functions and one of the characteristics or one of the requirements that we have already specified for the uh, back propagation networks is that the uh, activation functions are uh, I mean must necessarily be differentiable right. And uh, I mean more than that we did not specify any other uh, limitation for the activation functions, but 
it is uh, seen that okay, I mean, I mean one of the, um, uh, I mean some typical activation functions which people use are the logistic functions, okay, which involves uh, the sigmoids which are in the range of 0 to 1, I mean that is of the form of 1 by 1 plus exponential to the power minus a v, I mean uh, functions of that form or the other possibility is to use tan hyperbolic function. Okay. Now, uh, if you plot the logistic function, you will see that you will get a characteristic like this. I mean, if this is the axis in which v is plotted and if this is the axis in which the phi v is plotted, uh, then uh, I mean 1 will be the final value, this is 0. So, you will get a function of this nature. Okay. And uh, in, in the case of tan hyperbolic uh, function, you will be getting a characteristic of this nature, okay. because there it will vary from minus 1 to plus 1. So, if this is the v and if this is the phi of v, which is of the form of tan hyperbolic, then this will be the nature. Now, here you can see that this function is not symmetric about 0. Okay. So, this is a non-symmetric function. This is non-symmetric about v is equal to 0, whereas this function is anti-symmetric about uh, v is equal to 0. And if you compare the learning capabilities of non-symmetric sigmoidal functions and anti-symmetric sigmoidal functions, okay, then it is seen that the sigmoidal functions with anti-symmetric activation functions of the type tan hyperbolic for example, okay, will have a better learning capability or, or a faster learning capability. So, any multilayered perceptron that is trained with antisymmetric activations where antisymmetric property will be simply defined as phi of minus v equal to minus of phi v. Okay. Now, this condition is not satisfied by logistic, okay, whereas this condition is definitely satisfied by tan hyperbolic. Okay. Uh, in, in fact, um, uh, for the tan hyperbolic logistic, I mean for the tan hyperbolic sigmoidal functions, okay, uh, the researchers have come up with different type of uh, uh, standard implementation and one of the implementations of uh, the tan hyperbolic functions was proposed by Le Kuhn. Okay, and, uh, they have specified the uh, function of the form phi v equal to a tan hyperbolic and the argument of the tan hyperbolic is b into v, where a and b are constants. Okay. And for their implementation, that is the one that was proposed by uh, Le Kuhn, uh, it was suggested that a has got a value of 1.7159 and b was taken to be two third. Okay. The significance of this is that we are going to have a characteristic of this nature. I mean, if we are taking A to be of this value, in that case definitely the uh, final value that this phi v function will achieve at the saturation is going to be 1.7159, because it is going to approach A in the limit. It is going to approach plus A in the positive limit and minus a in the negative limit. So, it will uh, vary between minus 1.7159 up to plus 1.7159. Okay. This will be the nature of the tan hyperbolic function and for, for a function of this type, the interesting characteristic is that whenever you keep v, this is the axis of the v, if you keep v is equal to 1, okay, that means to say that if you are computing phi of 1, then phi of 1 is equal to 1. 
all right. Uh, I mean, although the final value is 1.7159, okay, at v is equal to 1, you are going to get phi v equal to 1. And likewise, I mean, since the function is anti-symmetric, you are going to have phi of minus 1 to be equal to minus 1. Okay. In fact, in this characteristic, one thing which you can notice that there are two portions of the curve. One is the linear part of it okay, and the other is the saturation part of it. So, I can describe this part, I mean the part beyond v equal to 1. That means to say that when mod of v is greater than 1, okay, we can say that this belongs to the saturation part of the characteristic, whereas as long as mod of v is less than or equal to 1, this is a linear characteristic. So, this is linear, whereas this one is the saturation. And we can say roughly that as if to say that v is equal to 1 is lying at the boundary of the linear to saturation zone. Okay. And we will use this, uh, I mean very shortly. Okay. So, the third heuristic that we were describing is again related to the activation function and we have seen that anti-symmetric functions are better as compared to the non-symmetric functions. Okay. The fourth heuristic is pertaining to the target values. Okay. Now, target values means that definitely in the training set, we are going to have the uh, input set. Okay, we, we are going to have the input vector as also the uh, output values. Okay. Now, the output values will be again in the range that is specified by the activation function, is not it. So, definitely if we are using a characteristics of this nature, let us say again a tan hyperbolic characteristics of this nature we take, then the activation function. Uh, we cannot definitely exceed an activation function uh, a, a d, I mean uh, an, an expected output d of the neuron j. I mean if we are taking d j, d j certainly cannot exceed uh, 1.7159 at this end or cannot be less than minus 1.7159 at the same. So, definitely I mean it is implied that the activation function need to follow this, but again the, the question is that uh, uh, where should we keep the expected, I mean how, how should we select the patterns okay, so that the activation functions, I mean they could be lying close to the saturation region or they could be lying in the linear region. Now which one is better, I mean are we going to choose those patterns which are having they are expected outputs close to the saturation region of the characteristic or close to the linear range of the characteristic. Okay. Now, it is seen that the linear range of characteristics, I mean if we are choosing the DJs closer to the linear range of characteristic, it is better from a training point of view. But certainly, this is not the thing that you can always guarantee, because DJ is after all what your expected outputs which are drawn from the example. Now, it could be that for some of the patterns okay, which are available as examples, okay, this d j could be very close to 1.7159. In fact, there is no harm if it is exactly equal to 1.7159. Okay. So, what is done is that I mean in order to ensure a better learning, okay, I mean as a heuristic what one does is that one applies an offset to the desired output okay, before the training is performed. That means to say that we are not really training it with exact d j. Okay. I mean if d j is close to the limits, I mean if it is close to plus a or if it is close to minus a, then we are not taking the exact value of d j, rather we are taking some offsetted value of d j, so that we shift the d j points okay, more towards the linear range. For example, in this case if uh, I get a 
d j equal to 1.7159. In that case, the nice thing will be is that I apply an offset of minus 0.7159, so that my uh, d j is equal to 1, because this 1 I know is definitely closer to the linear range. Okay. So, that is why what we have to do is to modify the target value. So, we must keep d j equal to a minus epsilon, okay, some positive quantity epsilon okay, for the limiting value, I mean when the limiting value is plus a. Okay. For the limiting value of plus a, we must make d j equal to a minus epsilon and when the limiting value is minus a, then what we should do? Yes. So, for a limiting value of minus a, we should have d j equal to minus a plus epsilon. Right. So, this is the heuristic on the target values and the uh, next point that we are going to uh, deal with is regarding the normalization of the input. Now, normally we are not putting any restriction on the set of patterns with which we are going to train, right. So, I mean uh, in general it will be a set of training patterns in the m dimensional space. Now, since we again cannot visualize an m dimensional space, let us consider the simplest case of a two dimensional space for our ease of visualization. Okay. Supposing we have got an x 1, x 2 space, where we have got two inputs basically x 1 and x 2 okay. and the set of patterns okay, that could be very widely distributed okay, like we could have let us say the set of patterns like this. Supposing, I mean all these points that I have marked in this two dimensional space, okay, they are the set of points with which we are going to train. Okay. I mean those are the input patterns that are available. Now, what is the characteristic that you are observing? You see that the way I have drawn the axis, both x 1 and x 2 could vary in the positive as well as the negative range, but we have chosen the pattern where we are always having the patterns selected out of I mean barring except one or two patterns which are lying in this quadrant, but most of the quadrant I mean patterns in this particular example are lying in the first quadrant okay, with x 1 and x 2 both as positive. Okay. Now, is it very good? Surely not, because you are training the back propagation network for a good generalization capability. right? So, that means to say that it should encounter the patterns okay, which are varying in values equally between positive and negative values. So, ideally we should take the patterns where x 1 varies in the range of say minus uh, a to plus a and I mean not this a of course, I mean I am saying some uh, limits of uh, x 1 in the positive and negative and similarly x 2 also in some minus and plus range that can vary. And if, if we can get the pattern like that, that is the best, but again as I told you that obtaining the patterns may not be at our hand, because we are drawing the examples okay, from some real life data which are already available as examples. And it could be that the examples themselves are such that only these many examples are available. But that does not mean that whenever we are testing the network okay, with unknown patterns, the unknown patterns cannot be like this. Unknown patterns can be. Who says that everything should be available or very similar patterns should be available as examples only? we can have unknown patterns here and in this case there is no good reason to believe that the 
network will have a good generalization capability because it has seen the patterns in this region, but it has not seen the pattern in this region during the training, but during the testing it has encountered a, a pattern like this. So, that is why we have to do something with the input, some manipulation, some uh, manipulation is needed with the input data before we actually train the network with the pattern, right. So, what is the kind of uh, normalization that we do? Now, in this example I have shown you that x 1 and x 2 are both ha having uh, some positive bias. In this example, there is a positive bias to both x 1 and x 2. So, what if we obtain the mean of the x 1 and x 2 value and if we subtract the mean value from all these observations from each one of these observations. In that case, we should get a distribution okay, that should uh, be equally balanced between the positive and negative. Okay. So, what we can have is that the picture in this case may look something like this. I mean, whatever was uh, like this restricted to the first quadrant alone may now be looking like this. But, so this is a process of mean removal. So, this is the process of mean removal and in the process of mean removal actually we uh, are altering the input space. I mean we cannot call the input space as x 1 x 2 space anymore. We have to call it as a new space x 1 prime x 2 prime, right. So, uh, that is one of the steps that we do, that is the mean removal and in order to accelerate the back propagation algorithm, okay, we need to have some more steps to be performed after that and immediately after the mean removal, the step that is normally performed is a decorrelation of input. Okay. So, those who uh, are having difficulties in understanding the term decorrelation, okay. let me give you a simple example. Okay. Let us say that you have got a uh, set of time domain samples, supposing you have got some uh, voltage data or uh, any analog data you have got and you have taken time samples of that and each one of those time samples okay, you are representing with some digitized value. Now, you will be finding that the time samples are highly correlated from each other. By correlation what we mean? That the time sample that you are taking at n okay, will not be remarkably different from the time sample that you are going to take at n plus 1 or n minus 1. So, the data is highly correlated. Now, supposing you have got a sinusoidal wave okay, and the time samples, I mean if you are taking many samples, you will be finding that the time samples are highly correlated. But now, if you are converting the temporal data, the time domain data into a frequency domain data, then what will you get? I said the example of a sinusoidal wave, sinusoidal wave means it will have a frequency component and also I mean if, if you are uh, observing the sinusoid only through a small window, I mean if it is not a continuous sinusoidal wave which will be in the case of the discrete thing. Then we will be having I mean uh, because of the truncation effect of the sine wave, we are going to have some more components also. But other than that the frequency uh, components will be highly uncorrelated. So, the reason why we often transform from the time domain to the frequency domain is because we want to decorrelate the data and decorrelation is very often useful for things like data compression. Okay. Because if we decorrelate the individual components, then it is possible for us to represent it by a smaller number of uh, samples as compared to the original domain with which we were working. 
In fact, decorrelation, I mean there are different methodologies for performing decorrelation and one of the effective ways whereby the decorrelation is performed is principal component analysis. Okay. And we are going to study principal component analysis shortly, okay. not immediately, I mean maybe after a few lectures we will be uh, coming to the question, uh, I mean to the topic of principal component analysis which are very often used in order to decorrelate the data. Now, what happens is that, so the steps that we are doing is that the first step is mean removal and the next step is going to be decorrelation. So, whatever you have as x 1 prime, x 2 prime okay, will now be decorrelated. Decorrelated means this data set could now be uh, getting more, uh, I mean spreaded. Okay. Like if we are having a decorrelated set of patterns, then the patterns may be looking like this. In fact, what happens is that the, uh, I mean this is the x 1 axis, not x 1 anymore because already because of the mean removal we were calling it as x 1 prime. So, now with the decorrelation we are going to call it as x 1 double prime and this axis will be x 2 double prime. In fact, uh, the uh, scaling on x 1 double prime and x 2 double prime are quite different as you can see from here. So, what happens is that after the decorrelation you have to do one more step and that is called as the covariance equalization. Okay. What is meant by covariance equalization is that the covariances in the x 1 direction and x 2 direction in this case they are different. So, you scale it appropriately so that the covariances in x 1 direction and x 2 direction are equal and after the covariance equalization you will get the pattern okay, somewhat in this range. Okay, if they are equalized, if the covariances are equalized, we are going to get the pattern. So, now we are going to call this as a new space x 1 triple prime and x 2 triple prime. So, in effect what we are doing is the normalization of the inputs. Okay. So, now that we have transformed the input space into a new space x 1 triple prime x 2 triple prime, where the data are having 0 mean number 1, number 2 the data are highly decorrelated and number 3 where their covariances are equalized. Now, on this, on this data, okay, on this space if we apply the uh, back propagation algorithm, okay, the learning is seen to be better. So, this is the process of the normalization of the input which we had listed as the fifth heuristic in our case. Okay. The next heuristic and which is perhaps uh, the most crucial and important of this is the initialization. Okay. By initialization we mean to say that the question which should very often arise is that we begin with the training of a network let us say a multilayer perceptron network, which we are going to train with the set of uh, examples that we have got. But the billion dollar question is that how to choose the initial weights. Okay. Is it absolutely arbitrary that we choose any initial weight and the system should adapt itself, I mean should adjust the synaptic connections in such a manner that ultimately all the training pattern examples are learned and then uh, when we feed the test pattern then uh, I mean it can correctly generalize the test patterns also. If it can do that I mean, I mean it is uh, good I mean if it is uh, capable of doing that, but the, 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 the question is that yes I mean given the convergence criteria of the multilayered perceptron, 
okay. It is going to happen, but surely the question is that how quickly is the convergence going to be? How quickly will the network learn, okay, if we uh, start with any arbitrary combination of weights? And then the question that should come is that if you are having, let us say you are having an activation function of this nature, okay. Now, you start with some initial weight. Let us say that this is the activation function of a neuron, okay, which is connected to several inputs. One neuron connected to several inputs, say it is like this, okay. Now, the question is that uh, I can choose the initial weights such that the total activation function, I mean the activation value V or rather the local induced field what we refer to. So, we can choose the WGIs such that the local induced field is here. In some other occasion, we could choose somewhere over here. In some other occasion, we could choose the initial weights such that the initial local induced field is lying over here. Now, the question is that which one is better? Whether we want again the initial local induced field in this region or whether we want the initial local induced field is in, in this region, whether it is close to the linear region or close to the saturation region. Okay. So, this is another decision that we have to uh, make. Okay. And let us see the uh, two extreme cases. I mean one of the extreme cases is that we can choose the initial weights such that the local induced field is very small. Okay. That means to say we choose small initial values. If we choose small values of WGIs, because ultimately our induced uh, local field that is Vj is going to be what? Summation of WGI Yi, okay. I summed up from 1 to m. That is what we are doing, I mean where m is the number of inputs. Okay. Now, the question is that whether we want the, now if we have the WGIs to be small, in that case naturally that will lead to a small value of Vj. Okay. So, we can have small Wijs to start with or we can have large Wijs to start with. Now, which one is having what kind of effect? Okay. So, that is what we are going to study in the uh, I mean sixth heuristic which is under consideration that is the initialization, right. Now, we can begin with large initial values. Now, large initial values means obviously our operating point in this characteristic would be somewhere close to the saturation. Okay. So, large initial values could lead to saturation, right? Because the initial values could be very close to the saturation region, and in the saturation region, you can see that the gradient is 0, okay? The gradient of the activation function is 0. So, we are going to have, so if we choose large initial values, it leads to saturation and saturation obviously leads to small local gradient and small local gradient means that it leads to slow learning. Okay. So, naturally very large initial values are not good for us and the other extreme is that we can choose small initial values. And small initial values means that our operating point will be close to here, close to the origin. Okay. But in this case, the drawback that one encounters is that the network operates on a flat area around the origin of error surface. So, 
this is also not I mean if it is on a flat area okay, then definitely I mean uh, it takes uh, time or I mean it is not a guaranteed convergence that one gets. So, even small initial values are also not welcome. Okay. So, what we really require is something in between these two. Okay. So, the proper choice, the proper choice is somewhere in between. Right. So, this is what we are going to study that what exactly is this somewhere in between, okay. whether we should have here or here or here, okay. is it possible for us to decide. So, let us uh, do a bit of statistical analysis in order to decide that. Okay. So, we uh, take the example of a multi layered perceptron using tan hyperbolic function. So, we take a multi layered perceptron in short form I am writing it as MLP okay, uh, using tan hyperbolic activation function. And also we are considering the neurons to have 0 bias. So, for the time being we are neglecting the bias or considering it to be 0 bias. So, that the induced local field of neuron j, okay, v j you can understand that the induced local field of neuron j will be given by what w j i y i, where y i is the input okay, uh, and w j i is the strength of the connection between the neuron j and the neuron i. Okay. I mean j is the neuron under consideration. So, it is w j i and this will be summed up for what? For i is equal to 1 to m. Okay. Now, we have uh, now we are assuming we are making some assumptions on this input okay. and the assumptions that we are making are 1 that it is 0 mean input. and it is assumed to have unit variance. Okay. Although this unit variance is not mandatory, I mean it is only for the ease of our analysis that we are choosing the unit variance. Now, we are, uh, so what we can do is that from this equation, it is possible for us to obtain a mu y. What is meant by mu y? Mu y will mean the expectation of the y i's. Okay. So, we are taking all the y i's that means to say i is equal to uh, 1, 2 etcetera etcetera up to m. So, we are taking the expectation over this y i's and this is since it is assumed to have a 0 mean input, we should have expectation of y i to be equal to 0 right? and the variance because we are assuming unit variance, we can write sigma square y to be equal to the expectation of y i minus mu y, okay, this squared. Right? This is the definition of the variance and this in fact, I mean because mu y is going to be equal to 0, we can simply write it as expectation of y i square and what is expectation of y i square? That is equal to unity. Okay. So, this is equal to unity for all i because we have assumed unit variance. Okay. And another assumption that we are making is that the inputs are uncorrelated. So, the third assumption is that the inputs are uncorrelated. Right. 
So, if we take that assumption into consideration, then it is possible for us to write that expectation of y i y k will be equal to what? 0 for i not equal to k, okay. 0 for k not equal to i and what happens if k is equal to i? 1, right. So, this is the uncorrelated thing that uh, only when i and k are the same, then we are going to get the expectation uh, to be equal to unity, otherwise it is equal to 0. And also we are making some assumptions about the synaptic weights. So, the, so what we are expecting is that the synaptic weights that we are choosing here are uniformly distributed set of numbers with 0 mean. So, for which we can now write that mu w, okay. so that is what we are getting as the expectation of w j i, the expectation of this weights. So, since we are choosing the weights also from a 0 mean variable, we should have expectation of w j i to be equal to 0 for all j i pairs. Okay. And for the variance, we can write and for the variance of the synaptic weights, we can write sigma square uh, w, which is equal to the expectation of w j i minus mu w. Mu w is the mean weight okay, and mean weight is equal to 0 as I said. So, here we can simply write it as this is equal to expectation of w j i square. Okay. Again, since this is valid for all j i pairs, right. Um, uh, yeah, I mean we are we are considering, I mean we are now drawing, no, this is this is valid for uh, not only for initial, that is this, uh, this is valid everywhere, but we are using this result in order to choose the initial weight. Okay. So, all this analysis is being done in order to help us in choosing the initial weights. Followed. So, this is our sigma square w okay. and now we can uh, write that uh, I mean accordingly the mean of the induced local field that is mu of v okay that we haven't uh, really expressed okay we have obtained the expression of vj i mean we have used the expression of vj okay but we are now interested in finding out the variance of the induced local field so we are first of all going to find out the mean of the induced local field and then the variance of the induced local field. So, mean and variance of induced local field, this is what we are calculating. So, the mean is uh, expectation of V j, which is equal to expectation of summation i is equal to 1 to m w j i y i, right. I mean it is simply substituting the expression for the v j and this is equal to, I mean I can take the summation outside also, that is it is one and the same as writing summation i is equal to 1 to m and writing it as a product of expectation w j i expectation of 
y i. In fact, there is no need to expand it any further because this value is going to be equal to 0. So, the mean of the induced local field is definitely going to be 0. Okay. I mean uh, and that is there and then the question is that what is going to be the variance of the induced local field. So, the variance we can express similarly. So, we are interested in finding out sigma square v. Okay. So, sigma square v can now be expressed as the expectation of what v j minus mu v yes v j bar or mu v. So, it is v j minus mu v square okay, and mu v in this case is equal to 0. So, it is expectation of v j square simply. Okay. So, in the next uh, slide I am going to just write down the expression for this v j. I mean I am going to substitute the expression for this v j. In fact, because the expect uh, I mean expression involves v j square, okay. I can in fact express it as the product of two v j's or rather I can express it in this manner v j square because it is expectation of v j square, I can write it as sigma square v equal to expectation of summation, I can express it as the double summation i is equal to 1 to m and k is equal to 1 to m w j i w j k y i y k right. And this could be rewritten as taking the summation out i is equal to 1 to m k is equal to 1 to m expectation of w j i w j k expectation of y i y k okay which is equal to summation of i is equal to 1 to m expectation of w j i square. Okay. Because we are definitely making use of the property of the correlation. I mean we have already defined that uh, the data are uncorrelated because of which we are going to have expectation of y i y k to be equal to 1 for k is equal to i. So, only for k is equal to y terms we are going to have this equal to 1. So, this definitely leads to this uh, I mean uh, expectation of w j i square and since the expectation of w j i square is what that is equal to sigma square w for all all j i pairs. Okay. So, what will be the final value? This is summed up for i is equal to 1 to m. So, it will be m times sigma square w okay. because sigma square w is equal to expectation of w j i square okay, for all j i pairs. Okay. Now, this is an expression that is of interest to us that is sigma square v that is to say the variance of the induced local field is equal to m times sigma square w. Now, what is going to be the best value of sigma square v? Again, we were mind you considering the tan hyperbolic characteristic, tan hyperbolic activation function. Now, in the tan hyperbolic activation function, if we choose the values which were proposed by Le Kun and others, we choose A is equal to this value and B is equal to two thirds. So, that for V is equal to 1, we get the phi V to be equal to 1. Okay. In that case, this one is becoming our linear region okay, and this is the saturation region. So, if the variance is chosen so that it is up to the border line of the uh, um, 
saturation and the linear region. I mean that means to say what? That your activation function could vary, okay? I mean its, it's variance could be between, I mean variance should be close to 1, okay? If you were choosing that, then we can say that the patterns are equally, almost equally distributed between the, I mean uh, linear and the saturation region. So, if, if we choose the sigma v to be equal to unity from this characteristic, in that case, so, so by choosing, by choosing sigma square v equal to 1 out of this characteristic, what we get is, we are getting m into sigma square w equal to 1, which means sigma square w is equal to 1 by m. And this is a relation that we can make use of. That means to say that the variance, the initial variance that you are going to have for the weights is equal to 1 by m, where m is the total number of inputs. So, now since you are going to know about this m a priori, that is how many number of inputs you are having. So, the best thing will be to design the synaptic weights, the initial synaptic weights such that you have the initial synaptic weights with 0 mean, that is number 1 and the variance of the synaptic weights should be equal to 1 upon m. Okay. So, uh, this is up to the heuristic uh, point number 6, where initialization is uh, concerned and we have got one or two points more to be covered on the heuristics, okay, which we are going to cover in the next class.